Okay, we're ready to roll. Okay, let's go. Welcome to the three o'clock talk, named, aptly named Carbonitis by Example. My name is Christian Newman, and glad to have you a little bit awake after the lunch break, because normally two o'clock means the um, dead shift presentation slot. What we're going to do today is actually, I'm going to walk you through um, how an app works against or rather with Carbonitis by using a small code base example. Take you through, and this is exactly what we're going to talk about, take you through how it's packaged, how it's deployed, and all the rest of it. So I'm going to give, given the fact that most of you are apparently are familiar with the technology, I'm going to keep the intro and the positioning rather short. Um, we're going to discuss the prereqs. The code is on GitHub, as you will see, so you can clone it. Um, and play with it, and that's the whole purpose. And I think I'm going a little, into a little bit in, into, 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 into the mic here, in terms of loud, just for the people. So it's okay, but I shouldn't be, okay, in that case I'll keep my distance, fair enough. Okay, um, as I said, um, the idea is, the slides will be up Monday morning, the very latest on the website, that you take the slides, take the code base, and play with it. That's the whole intention of this presentation. Not for you just to sit here and listen and maybe ask questions later, but rather um, maybe close these tiny gaps that you still have if you see something that you don't know. This is what this presentation is all about. And you can say, because we're a small audience, I may take questions in between, but I'm going to lead that, if that's OK with you. OK, first, a couple of, que uh, a couple of remarks rather about myself. I'm a computer science PhD uh, by training. I did, that was mid-90s, yes, I'm old. I did my PhD in reflective operating system architectures. Um, the idea at the time, and, we, and you're talking mid-90s here, was to construct a kernel architecture that allows applications to modify kernel behavior at runtime in a very specific guarded way. Um, the Japanese did that with Lisp. We did it with C++ using an experimental micro, uh, micro, um, microkernel architecture. A guy called James Gosling, Java inventor, must have read the thesis very thoroughly, because if you take a close look at the reflection API as part of the JDK 1.5, you see quite a few concepts directly from the thesis. Unfortunately, I didn't patent the IPs, because otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here, but I would be streaming this presentation from my own Caribbean island, part by Oracle. <laughs> One of the few mistakes I made, okay. As part of this PhD, um, we didn't use BSD um, as, a, as a development and test system, but rather this new thing called Linux. Again, guys, we're talking about 93, 94 here. So Linux was just emerging, and that was, most, and that was my first crush with an operating system. And I started to use that when the kernel has, had just reached 0.95 as a version. At the moment, among other things, I'm doing tech support and more at the Frankfurt Linux user group. Um, I'm a podcaster, and if you can't get to sleep at night, um, the podcast URL is, is on that slide. Just take a look. We have been doing this podcast for three years, and I reckon um, downloads clock in between 7,500 and 10,000 per episode. I think our niche is actually black humor and technology. I won't say more because this is not a pitch about the, about the podcast, but rather if, you, if you're game for a little bit of humor beyond technology, check it out. Um, other hobbies include anything around software development life cycles, um, IT security, and other forms of black art also belong to that category. Clouds, of course. And um, every now and then I do gigs. So if you have a problem that you cannot solve, my email address is on the very last, uh, is on the very last slide, so I'm open for hire. Okay, um, I won't go into the details. Suffice it to say, uh, Docker is a, oh sorry, a container, um, and container technologies are about operating system virtualization technologies as in levels in terms of applications, share user land, but it stops there. In contrast to VMs, the kernel across containers stays the very same. That's the major difference, or one of the major differences between a container and a full-blown VM. Needless to say, cont containers don't, do not make much sense, especially if you deploy them by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the ten thousands, without a proper orchestration framework. And it's about 2006, 2005, the features or the 
the, the mechanisms that were used for, to implement these containers in the, in the Linux kernel had just been implemented. And Google, among other people, was looking for a way to control, to manage these containers on a very large scale. Because at the time, they immediately recognized the advantages in terms of resource consumption in contrast to full-blown BMs and all the rest of it. And hence, this project called Bork was born. And the first, I think the first, the first commit was around 2009, 2010, or something like this, in terms of when they internally wrote this out big time. Um, the, rest is, the rest is history. Uh, what was then known as Borg is now known as Kubernetes. It's a cloud-native computing foundation project that gives you some impression of the industry adoption by now. Needless to say, quite a few companies have picked up that, te that technology, um, Rancher to name but one, and, and have wrote their own with regards to um, providing value adds around, uh, around native Kubernetes and all the rest of it. Um, any questions so far? Okay, cool. Okay, um, first of all, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of a, of a um, <laughs> pip and storm minus our requirements, I have named that slide, in terms of what is required to get this playground, uh, to get this playground up and running. You need a POSIX compliant operating system. Linux, of course, comes to mind but also the BSDs will do nicely with regards to um, if you install the right packages, you can actually run containers on BSD. You need a container runtime, goes without saying. Anything will do, Cryo, Containerd, Podman, whatever, as long as it's open, uh, as long as it's basically OCI compliant and can, and can talk to, to Kubernetes. Um, with regards to Kubernetes deployments, you do have a few options. Minishift, Minikube probably runs, runs Bell. Essentially a piece of software that installs a VM on your, on, on your machine and then spins up containers on a single node cluster. And this is the overall idea behind, behind many of these things, to give you essentially a small limited playground that doesn't consume an awful lot of resources, but rather allow you to, to, to do the first steps towards a full-blown deployment, possibly crossing multiple physical machines. Um, if you install the community edition of something called Docker, Docker for Desktop that already has a basic Kubernetes um, cluster built into it, again, you're looking at a single node that allows you at least to run um, kubectl and other commands. Who of you have, you have used kind before? One, okay. The idea behind kind is actually you can roll your own cluster inside containers. So essentially what you do is um, you, when you bootstrap kind, it's essentially it basically creates a couple of containers that reflect nodes. Um, this is the overall idea in a nutshell. Needless to say, that doesn't give you the high availability, the resilience with regards to hardware failures as a full-blown cluster consisting of multiple physical machines or even VMs would do. Uh, but again, it's something on the cheap side in terms of um, you can allocate more than one node using a single machine. That's the overall, overall idea. Needless to say, uh, Minikube, Minishift, um, Kind, all on GitHub, just basically a user search, a user favorite search engine of choice. Of course, you can also do it yourself. Um, I've done this about a year ago. It takes about, for me, it took first time around about half an hour to get this up and running because essentially what you do is you take a Debian at the time, like I think I took Bullseye, but I'm not sure, but I can't remember. Either was it, it was either Bust or Bullseye. Then used KVM to create two VMs on that Debian instance, bridge these networks, uh, bridge these VMs via, via network bridge, install the container runtime in these VMs. At the time, I used Cryo, if I recall correctly. And then, what, essentially, what you do is you bootstrap the cluster with a tool called Cube ADM. Anybody who doesn't know Cube ADM, so all of you know what Cube ADM is. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, the idea behind it, behind QADM, is essentially you install it on one machine that gives you the master of the cluster, and then you have the other machines joining this newly created cluster, one by one by one by one. What you essentially do is you install it on one machine, and then you, when you install it on the other machines, essentially point it to the master. And this, and needless to say, you can also automate this using Ansible Puppet the usual suspects, and that gives you pretty quickly a full-blown cluster without much effort. 
Um, and then, of course, if you need special network fabric, like flannel or something like that, basically, depending on your requirements, you, you have, of course, to install that too as, a, as an addition. And last but not least, for this playground to work, you need an ingress controller. I'm going to walk you through the steps to, of how to install this. And very important, you want to have your own image, your own image registry, meaning because essentially you will be building an image locally on your machine, meaning you want to don't you don't want to upload it to, to 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 the Docker register because that's that's an additional loop you, you simply don't need, but rather you pull down a container that implements that Im that implements an image registry, and then you can pull these images locally from your machine. This is the main advantage, and it it just saves you that additional loop through any external registry. Okay. Um, who doesn't know what a cluster IP, a node port, and a load balancer is with regards to services? Because if everybody, if everybody knows how to access services or to access ports in the cluster, I can keep that fairly short. So is there anybody who doesn't know what a, what a node port, especially a node port, an ingress, or, 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 a, or a, a load balancer is? OK, cool. Um, OK. First of all, how to install the ingress. I won't go through the steps uh, in very detail because essentially it's all documented um, either on the on the nginx side because essentially it is an engine. It's, it is the engine. Uh, it, it, it is the nginx based ingress that we will be using. The idea is, I mean, um, you could do it without. A proper ingress, but the load, but but the cluster won't start up because it needs an additional piece of software on top of an ordinary load balancer. Load balancer is just a service, right? As we all know, but the ingress exposes any any interfaces that the ports or the applications rather that the that the, that the applications implement um, in a very controlled way. Normally, if you if you create a load balancer on your hyperscaler of choice, whether it's Google, whether it's Azure, whether it's Alibaba, whether it's it's what whether it's the bookshop, they normally give you a, a load balancer implementation once you create this service. But you will be doing this on your on your machine. So in order to basically start it up, you need an ingress, and that's exactly what this slide is all about. Um, so essentially, what you do is <clears throat> you pull you pull down this this deployment YAML. Um, it'll start the ports automatically in that, spe in that uh, special namespace. Um, see if it's, if it's up and running. You simply, see, you simply check off what's going on in that, in that, in that namespace. Um, if you want to do a full pre-flight check in terms of wait until, and wait until the point in time when it's really operational, you simply type in this command. Because what, it, what essentially this command does, it's, it, looks, it looks for a special condition, and that is part of this kubectl invocation. Um, it gives it some label. That's the selector uh, definition. And it times out after 60 seconds, which normally is enough time for the ingress to start up. Um, once this ingress is up and running, you can simply then deploy the service that implements load balancer. Um, needless to say, if you want to... Um, if you want to see what's going on in that namespace, simply get the service definition from the namespace itself. Any questions? It's a little bit technical, but uh, you essentially need these steps if you, want to get, if you want to get the playground up and running. OK, this is how you install the local image registry. You simply pull, pull down an image and, and create a container. Um, this is all on, on, on the Docker registry. And what it essentially does is basically map support so that the port is well known. We need this later in the deployment files that I'm going to show to you. And it says, if that container failed, simply restore it, um, give it a name, and the image definition is actually registry colon two. An optional thing, if you want to see how the load is actually in your cluster, uh, you need something called a metro server. Sometime um, the 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 um, the things that I explained earlier on ter in terms of uh, the tools that simply create a, a, a local cluster on your machine sometimes have metric servers built in K3S, which is not mentioned on that slide, but again that's the kind of um, um, Kubernetes bootstrap, for example, has that defined as a as a as a, as a standard component. I think with Minishift or Minikube, you can also specify that, in, that you want to have a metric server. But 
for example, with the DIY stuff, you actually have to install it yourself. And this is essentially how you do it. Um, you pull down the, the, the corresponding YAML. Then you have to change this YAML um, because out of the box, this YAML only allows, in, uh, only allows HTTPS connections, which the kubectl sometimes does have trouble with connecting. So essentially what you just slot in is the kubelet minus insecure minus, uh, minus TLS definition in that, in that, in that component.yaml, and then you deploy it. And after that, kubectl top works, which gives you the resource, especially UCP utilization, of your cluster. But again, we won't be using this. It's just, this is just something, um, if you want to know what's going on in your cluster, this is how you do it. Okay, let's take a look at the code. Um, who of you do not know Go? About half, okay. In that case, uh, I'm going to go a little bit more into the details. Can everybody read that code, or should I, or should I enlarge the font? Cool, okay. Um, I won't explain each and every line of that code, because as I said, the, the code is on, Git, is, is on GitHub, but just to walk you through how what this code actually implements. Essentially, it's a very small web server. Um, you give it a few dependencies, i.e. you import so-called, I think they're called Go modules, if I'm completely um, mistaken. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a Golang guru. Uh, I use many programming languages, and Go, to and, and Go just happens to be one of them. Same goes for Rust or Python or, so, or some other stuff. Um, so you pull down these dependencies, then you create a new router object, uh, this router object basically allows you to attach endpoints to the web server, as in URLs, essentially. Um, then you create the server, and then with the parallel routine, you get the server up and running. The rest is a little bit of, of syntactic sure with regards to a control exit of the, um, of the web server, because essentially what this does is this creates a... Um, don't 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 crucify me, but this would be known as a coroutine in other languages. It's, 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 it's essentially a second thread that gets the that gets the um, server up and running, and that's exactly done by listen and serve. That's the um, method invocation, and what this and then it basically enters a function called wait for shutdown. This this wait for shutdown simply. Um, through a mechanism called a signal in, in Golang, waits for, say, a keyboard interrupt, and then tells the web server, please, please shut down now, so that the web server can serve any outstanding requests and then do a graceful exit slash shutdown. That's the overall idea behind this logic. Now, much more importantly, what exactly does this handler do? This handler, attached to forward slash, is essentially in, the ch in, in charge of decoding the URL it was invoked with. Um, then it looks up the container name, and um, the container name in, I think I have yet to find the container runtime where it's not in the environment. The container name you can pick up from the environment. It's normally found in an environment variable inside the container called hostname. So once you get this environment name, you have the container ID of the container you're running in. That's the overall idea. Let's do a quick check. Okay, still time. Um, after that, it cuts down the, um, the container name to 32 characters, and then it simply decodes the URL, um, sees if, if there is a name defined in the query string of the URL, and if that's not the case, it simply, uses, uh, it simply chooses a default name, as in guest, and then what it does, it prints a log message, and it, get, and it gets back a response to the server interface saying hello name um, from container with the ID that, that we have just extracted from the environment. It's as simple as that. Um, and what you essentially do is you want to now transform this into an image that you can use to instantiate a container. So this is the corresponding Docker file. The Docker file is essentially a multi-stage building, um, building approach where you simply use the container to build that web server in the image. So the way it works, essentially, you use um, a predefined image called Golang that rests on top of a user land called Alpine. Um, 
that we will also use for container deployment, funny enough. Uh, and this is the important bit. You, you name this stage builder because in the second stage, you will refer back to this building, um, to this builder stage. You copy um, the module definition and the, and the module summary from the working directory to, um, to the image. Um, and then you install the, um, the requirements in terms of the Go modules required to build this web server. And then you, what you do in line 20, you, ins you compile that, that small web server. Very important, you give it as an environment variable, see go enabled underscore equals zero. Because what that does, it will build a statically linked executable without no further requirements other than the loader. Meaning that built application is self-contained. No shared object dependencies. This is the important bit because otherwise you would have to fiddle around with any missing stuff um, from, from shared objects inside the container. And that's exactly what you don't want. So keep it simple, it hasn't changed. Um, once you have built this thing, um, you essentially install two additional, um, 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 or you install a set of certificates. That's exactly what this APK command does. And then you take this static linked com, um, um, binary that we built in, stage called, in, in the stage called builder, you take this and copy that into the second stage. Um, then you expose port 8080. This is the port where the container, uh, this, is where, this is the port where the web server will be listening on. And then you simply invoke, as the last command in line 37, you invoke the web server. Um, this is how you build the web server inside a container and then, and, and then deploy it as in creating a container from the image. Any questions on this Docker file? Because this is the crucial, uh, this is the crucial part. Yes. Um, you could possibly also roll it into one. Um, I thought it was the, I thought it was better to separate these things from a from a structural perspective, so that you want, so that one stage builds builds the whole thing, the way you, you, where you have a clear separation between building the image and deploying the container. That's the reason why I use the multi-stage Docker file. Any other questions? Yes. Um, since you are already statically linked with the binary, why did uh, since you are already statically linking the binary, uh, is there any good reason why you didn't use a distroless image but chose to use Alpine? Um, pure laziness. Um, Alpine is a default container image that I normally use because it's ultra compact, it's ultra, it's ultra short. I really like the simplicity of OpenRC in contrast to a full blown, to a full blown system D1. It's just a personal preference. Oh. I could have used something else too, but I just want to keep it simple. Oh, okay. and, of, mm -hmm. and of course, Golang, as in this, 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 uh, this, um, this image definition, is readily available. I don't have to modify it. Um, it's as simple as that. Yeah, I thought it had something to do like, with uh, the C libraries. Uh, no, the, the, the beauty about this, about this Golang uh, Colon Alpine image is that it's a compiler already installed in, in a complete Alpine user land. This is the main advantage of, of exactly using that image. A, Alpine is very compact. B, it has a pre-installed Go compiler. That's the main thing. And I don't have to fiddle around with any additional image uh, configuration before I deploy it as in compile the stuff. That's the reason. Thank you. OK, any other questions before I move on? OK, cool. Um, OK, uh, a little tiny thing that actually takes um, this image and then puts it into registry, again, a tiny shell script because what this essentially does, it builds the image, that's the first line. It removes any existing images from the local registry, that's the second line. It tags the image, that's line number three. And it finally pushes the image to the registry that is living on the local host at port 6000. Simple as that. Okay. So, um, we have the container, uh, we have built the image, we have Define the container. The image now is in the registry, in, 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 in the local registry. So actually, we're in a position to deploy this whole thing. Uh, so this is the this is the deployment file, as in the file that you use to tell Kubernetes now look where to get the image from, and how to run this essentially. And this is not really um, rocket science. Who of you hasn't written deployment files? So just one, two. 
Okay, in that case, let me let me walk through on a high level. Let me walk you through the through these because um, <clears throat> the, the the most important thing is probably uh, is, is probably the, the the definition of a replica set. This line means, dear Carbonitas, give me three parts of um, for 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 this image that I'm just to pull, that, that I'm just about to pull down. Meaning we have three web servers running in three separate parts inside Carbonitas. This is the overall idea. Um, the specification is just basically what the name of the image is, where to get it from, and only to pull it down if it's not already part of, of a local Carbonitas internal cache. And of course, part, last but not least, um, the web server inside a port can be reached at port 8080. That's exactly the deployment file. There's nothing more to it. Similar sim uh, with a similar simplicity, this is the service definition. It just exposes a node port at port 80, um, and it maps that port to, to the target port 80, uh, 8080. Um, so the idea is, and node port is, is, typical, um, is typically, you, have, you open up the cluster in a guarded way. But Kubernetes doesn't care where an invocation lands. So, in contrast to a full-blown load balancer or other mechanisms, the port selection is purely random. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you now when I A, deploy this, and B, um, invoke the whole thing. So, this is what my default namespace looks at the moment. So we have just the control plan up and running. C can you see this? Okay. We have just the control plan up and running. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, needless to say, the system namespace looks a little bit different. The system namespace, um, I, I assume you all know what the system namespace is, as in cube system. This is actually where the where the um, Kubernetes components themselves live. So we have the API server. We have a service called core DNS, which is essentially in charge of DNS resolution. Um, we have the container that implements a proxy up and running in that, in that cube system. So a proxy essentially, as we will see in a minute, or rather down, uh, down the presentation, a proxy allows you to access um, not only the control plane, but other stuff as well from the outside. Um, and of course, we have the ingress, um, no, that, sorry, that's a different namespace, but also the metric server in, this, in, this, in the system namespace. So in order to deploy um, this uh, web server, I say kubectl apply minus f, then the deployment file, and the deployment has been created, good news. Uh, and we want to take one. And now my default namespace looks like different. We do have these three uh, parts, um, also, uh, replicate, uh, also referenced by the replica set, because essentially these are the three parts that are defined in my deployment. Um, we do have a no part definition. A service essentially is a link, for want of a better expression, a link between a deployment and the outside world. It's essentially a network layer um, on top of an existing set of ports that allow outside access. And this is what we're going to see now. I hope. That's a simple while loop. No, it's not. And that happens if you are on the wrong machine. Can everybody see this? What this essentially does it just invokes a web server at port 80, and it does that in an infinite loop. And this is all there is to it. Okay, any questions? No. Um, now, if I want to, first of all, I'm gonna delete because we're going to now move on to resilience, high availability, and some other stuff. So I have to delete these, um, these, these, the service, and of course also the deployment. Yes. I'm 
going to alter the deployment. Okay, now what we're going to do, um, this is the same code base, only slightly amended. And the and the big and the main difference is essentially now. Sorry, wrong window. Um, if you take a look at the root definitions for the um, for the multiplexer, it now has, in contrast to the previous one, it has now two additional URL handlers, namely health and readiness. Now, what these two additional um, handlers do. And we're going to go through the um, through the deployment definition in a minute. These are checkpoints, for want of a better expression, where Kubernetes can check out if a port is still healthy and take requests. So, what essentially Kubernetes does, depending on the definition in your deployment file, it invokes these two URLs, and based on the status code it gets back, it marks a the port is either busy, as in cannot accept requests, or as broken, in terms of it has to be resorted. And that's exactly what these two additional functions do. Um, this is a little bit of a, of a logic now built in. Um, I, have two, I have two booleans, sad and busy. Sad means I'm really sad, I have to be restarted in terms of I'm, bro I'm, I'm internally broken. That's exactly what this, what this variable reflects. And busy means, so no, sorry, I cannot take requests at the moment. Um, I also have a busy counter that essentially implements a, um, a self-healing logic, which of course I didn't need, but I just wanted to give it a shot, see what happens um, when um, um, Action Kubernetes uh, notices that, uh, and this is just experimental code, when Kubernetes actually notices that, 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 that a part actually is up and running again. But anyway, okay, um, the corresponding handlers are implemented right here. So it just basically, it checks if sat is set, and then it gives back in a status internal server error. Um, Kubernetes um, regards a port as healthy if it can invoke that URL and it gets back a status code of 200 or anything, I think, beginning with the two. Anything above 400 as a return code or as a status code, the port is considered unhealthy or busy. That, and that's exactly what these two handlers do. And the variables are set up here in terms of it, they take a look at at the name that is defined in the query URL, and if it's sat, it actually, if, if the name is equal to sat, it actually sets the flag sat to true, and it does the same with busy. And this is how it works. Um, so let's see how now this deployment looks like. So in addition to the deployment that we had now, um, we do have now two additional sections called the liveliness probe and the readiness probe, where these URLs that we just saw in the code are defined with corresponding ports, uh, with the corresponding ports, the scheme, and all the rest of it. That comes basically from from the second deployment. Um, but now we define health and readiness, and also say, now look, give give a port five seconds after you created it to get ready. Um, same goes for liveness probe. Only check five seconds after you've created the port if it's if it's broken or not. Um, and the period seconds, essentially, as the name would imply, reflect the time between different URL invocations. That's essentially how it works. So, what I have to do now, a, eh, I have to copy the amended code paste to my to my main driver, recreate the image, which is done now. The image now is in, re, in, the, rest, in, in, in the registry. And now what I can do, I can actually deploy the whole thing. kubectl uh, apply minus f. I'm going to use the second deployment that I've just walked you through. I also deploy the second service. 
namespace should should look like exactly before. Um, yes. Okay. And my test frame should be sh should be still up and running. Is it no? Is it not? And, and now you see, based on the amended code base, you also, you also see the, the, the output of the two flags. Now, if I say busy, and I should probably get myself a second shell now. Move this slightly up here, if the machine lets me. Okay, now basically I said, now look, here's the name busy in the, in, the, in the invocation URL. And in the other window, the endless loop is still pulling the, pulling the web server. And now it has the port F8 FCB has actually set its busy flag to two. So you see this down here, and at the next invocation after the period as defined in the deployment file, this port won't be invoked anymore until the port, until the port internal um, busy counter expires. And this is the main idea behind this. Now, um, and we're going to take another look at the default namespace. Um, what you will see here is actually that it, uh, that the um, that Kubernetes also has marked the port as not ready, because the port is not a, is not in a position to accept invocations anymore, because that's exactly what this what this what this liveliness probe, sorry what this readiness probe actually just triggered. So in contrast to this, if I now say sat, it will restart. Um, the port, because now the port has, depending on the health probe, told Akabanitis, sorry, I'm broken. And if the demo gods are, it probably will take some time, but now you see that actually Kabanitis has restarted the port SLXSL, which picked up the side, the, the side invocation. And that's exactly how it works internally. What you will see is once the port has been restarted, it's up and running from a Kubernetes pr perspective again, because now it tells Kubernetes, or Kubernetes tells you, all three ports are up and running and are, be, uh, and are able to accept requests. But this very port has indicated that, has, that it has been restarted about 19 seconds ago when be prior to this uh, to this point in time, the port will cover need to sorry and broke internally. This is how it works. Any questions? Okay. Um, and of course, that is also second service. Um, the main idea is basically that it ties it to a cluster IP, which is then be uh, we being able to act to be accessed actually through the ingress. This is how it works. So I, I forgot about this, but this is not. But in contrast to the second deployment file, this is not really magic, um, because all, mainly all that has changed actually that, that the specification that the type in the spec uh, section moved from node port to cluster IP, so that the, so that the ingress can pick it up. That's the main difference. Okay, um, back to the presentation. We have now five minutes left. Okay, so I have to I have to give it a little bit of a shot. Um, um, to sum this up. As we just saw, scalability and availability are easily incorporated in the apps. We just saw an excerpt of how you can do this in terms of this. Of course, there's much more. Um, the corresponding documentation on the website, on the Kubernetes website, will tell you the final details. But as you saw, this is not rocket science. With a little bit of an, of an extension of your app, that can be incorporated pretty easily. Um, the application monitoring framework come with the um, come out of the box, as in the batteries are included, because that's exactly 
what Kubernetes um, and corresponding technologies or, or extensions of Kubernetes give you in terms of application monitoring and, and, and health um, checking and all the rest of it. Because that's essentially what these orchestration frameworks are for. Um, containers in uh, applications being run containers is not a big deal. But controlling and monitoring these, these po potentially massively distributed applications is a totally different ballgame. That's exactly why um, I'm tempted to say containers without Kubernetes or an orchestration framework is, is like coffee without, without milk. But of course, that's a personal preference. Okay, and needless to say, that technology allows you to grow from a local machine right to, up to potentially massive deployments in clouds. Um, what I didn't show you is actually you can scale this up and down. In the interest of time, I won't do this. But essentially what you do is you change the number of uh, parts in the replica set. You can do this, and this is the important thing, you can do this while the deployment is up and running. Carbonitas will create the additional parts for you automatically on the fly. Same, same goes for scaling it down. Um, it's, really, it's really simple. Of course, Carbonitas has a few challenges. Um, hybrid and multi-cloud configurations tend to be complex in terms of um, if one portion of the workload is running on premises, the other one is, is running in a cloud, potentially on a different premises and all the rest of it, um, you have to start to fiddle around with network, with network technology that bridges these, these two clusters. You want to secure this needless to say and all the rest of it. Especially, especially if you are um, trying to connect Kubernetes deployments or clusters rather in different hyperscalers, this is where the real fun starts. There are a couple of projects out there. Um, the slide deck has a couple of, 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 uh, of links at the very end. Um, take a look. Um, but it doesn't come easy, and, and you actually you have to know what you're doing. And you also want to know some of the final details of your hyperscaler before, before you approach this. Then, of course, I simply named the security, as we just saw, um, local image a local image registry has, its, it has its, its advantages because if you just pull down images from, 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 from Docker Hub, um, Docker Hub, of course, does some initial vetting, if not completely mistaken, of anything that you put up there. But who tells you that these images do not contain harmful software? You simply haven't built them yourself. You don't know really, apart from what's on the web page, as in the description, what's in there. How does it work internally on all the rest of it? And this is the reason why I do not know any large organization, for example, one of my customer base, that does not run its own image registry for production workloads. Simple as that. They vet the base definitions that they, thank you, um, that they, that they pull down. Um, but they also essentially, um, they, they run their own thing. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through um, the details of the multi-architecture multi issues. Um, essentially, it boils down how you construct images and the binaries running in these images. But rather, a teaser. Um, you can do this, of course, on this laptop, but you can also do this. And this is, I think, world exclusive today. You can also do this on smartphones. Now, I'm going to, the Tubix talk has just, has just been accepted on the 1st of July. I'm going to tell at Tubix how you create a Kubernetes cluster on your smartphone. But as one last thing, um, let me show you how it looks. We don't, unfortunately, we don't have much time to do it from the, um, from the, uh, co uh, from, from the connection here, um, as in from, from, from the user that is running up here. But rather, let's do it actually on the phone. Um, so I'm now inside my, in, in, inside my Android 13 based smartphone. I now dial into a VM. The reasons why I have to create a VM, we go to Tubingen, see the presentation. And this is now, and this is work in progress. I, got the, I, I simply got this up and running the day before yesterday. So this is still kind of experimental. This is the reason why performance issues, for example, have not been addressed. But now, if you do, if you do, if you do a kubectl, you actually get a tiny cluster running on this Android device. And as you can see, it just takes time. Because this is a, this is a smartphone about 
six, seven years old. That's only the, the only device I had available at the time. So if anybody wants to, if anybody wants to sponsor this for the two weeks talk, I need an octa-core device with eight gigs of, of, of main memory and about 128 for a decent uh, storage on that smartphone wouldn't go astray. You will be mentioned in that talk, rest assured. Approach me afterwards if you have such a device, preferably two. Um, and as you can see, um, this is the control plane um, and this is the system, and this again will take time because uh, this is, as I said, this is an old quad-core device and it's just um, slow. And, it, and the storage amount isn't really that sufficient. And as you can see, this is, this is really Italian cluster running on the phone. Okay, any questions before we have to finish this? And thank you for your time. Uh, Mike, please. Um, the project GitHub page. Yes, ah, yeah. this is the project GitHub. You will, I will upload these slides Sunday night, Monday morning, the very latest. You will have this once you get home, back home again. For the people who living in Germany, you will be probably home by Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday. You will see these on the on the conference website. The slides or link to these slides. You will see them on, on the conference website, and then you can max yourself out. Thank you very much. All right, then let's start for today. Um, I have a new nice story for you, the proxy, automatic proxy configuration. That's our journey from VW that we have taken in the last few years. And I would like to tell you my story about it and how I became a maintainer of the proxy. <laughs> so uh, let's start with the introduction first. My name is Jan-Michael Brummer. I'm a long-time open source contributor uh, since 1995, starting with some reverse engineering of fingerprint drivers, which are now part of libfprintd, and then some ACPI stuff, and then I moved up the stack to the desktop level, where I'm taking part in the GNOME development. I'm maintainer of the GNOME web on some nice tools like Roger Router or the banking app for the FinTS standard in Germany. So uh, maybe you've heard of some of them. Um, this means, of course, that I'm also a contributor to uh, GTK, Glib, GNOME, SystemD, and so on. So a uh, nice full of stack of story, I can tell you. <laughs> and luckily, uh, I'm on the professional side, I have the opportunity to be a business partner management, a partner manager at VW Group IT. That means I'm responsible for the requirements of our, all of our brands and uh, to fulfill them in the group, group IT. And I'm also responsible for the Linux client at VW. 
And thanks to my boss, I have the chance uh, to also fix problems that we are finding in open source environment and also developing new software in the open source uh, environment and bring them upstream. So let's start with our journey. Um, that's the Linux client at VW. Uh, maybe you're wondering why we are using Linux at all at VW, because it's most likely a Windows world. No, it's not. Uh, we do have our software guys sitting at the carriot, and they were in need of a Linux client because car software development is no longer possible without the Linux system, because there are some third-party uh, vendors like NVIDIA who's saying uh, you will only get support when you're using a Linux distribution in a specific version, otherwise you're doomed. <laughs> uh, this also means that we have had a lot of self-managed Linux system and environment. This is, of course, not an accepted solution for us as a group IT. And um, so it was gave for a low number of people, of course, but once you're starting to uh, set up the environment for a complete software uh, development group, like hundreds and thousands of people, you still or you are in need for a managed client. And that's why I stepped up and said, okay, uh, the requirements that we need in Ubuntu 20.04 with adjustments for the corporate environment. And 